Good morning, church, and welcome to worship here at Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church. Happy Father's Day on this uh, Father's Day Sunday as well. We're so blessed that you're all able to join us from wherever you are this day, whether it's at home or on the road or whether you are with us here in person in the sanctuary. And we are so excited that we are going to be able to uh, reopen the doors of the sanctuary and invite those who feel like they are uh, able to come and worship in person we are planning to do that on June 28th, and that just is such an amazing journey that we have been on. Um, I do remember uh, when we left at the last service, I knew that the session was going to be voting. We all knew what the, the right answer was going to be, which is that it was going to be necessary to take the extraordinary step to close the sanctuary building to in-person worship. And I'm getting choked up even thinking about it right now. And I did cry as I gave the benediction that day, knowing that that was going to be such a difficult and uncertain journey that we'd be on. We have, as a worship team, grown together over the last several months as we have learned and improvised and prayed and uh, been creative in ways that we never knew we had the capacity for, have been challenged spiritually and technically to continue to make worship be available to everyone in spirit, if not in body. And it is with great joy that we look forward to the possibility that we'll be able to come together. Perhaps not everyone, there are many in our congregation for whom this is not going to be the right choice right now. And so we are going to continue to do what we've been doing, which is to provide worship online. So we'll be continuing to do that. But for those that feel like they are able, we are going to be opening the doors on June 28th. We'll have our uh, traditional times at 8.30 and 10.45. We'll, we'll record the first service and we'll put that online as, as quickly as we can. That means that the several of you who are sneak peekers on Saturday night are going to have to wait a few extra hours to see worship uh, after we do that. Um, we have been preparing like you can't believe for people to return under these new circumstances. It's been a, a real challenge. It's been very complicated and complex, but we have taken um, a, a number of steps to do everything that we possibly can think of to ensure the safety and well-being of our worshiping congregation as they come back to this sanctuary for in-person worship. Um, you'll be receiving information about those uh, guidelines for the new worship that we have in person. You'll get something in the mail. If you're on Facebook, you can get it that way. We'll have um, emails that will come out. Uh, there's also going to be a video that Mike's going to do for us. Um, also, um, posting information on the website. So just stay tuned um, for more information about what you can do. But we're already modeling some of the things that we are going to be expecting that people do, which is uh, primarily here today, which is to bring uh, a mask to wear. Uh, we have some folks who are here with us in the sanctuary who are sitting in our newly socially distant sanctuary demonstrating where it's going to be possible for people to sit. We've got hand sanitizer stations. We've got a new secure offering box. Um, and yet we all need to continue to work together to make sure that this is going to be a healthy environment for everyone. So in addition to bringing your mask with you, um, we're going to ask that people come in through the east entrance, through the narthex, through the lobby of the church. And you'll be able to see that now because we have some brand new glass doors that have been uh, installed. So it makes it easier for someone to hold the door so that you don't even have to do that for you. Um, we will ask that you come down the center aisle or the two uh, side aisles and sit six feet apart. You know the drill by now. Avoid touching things. And we've removed the temptation. We've, we've taken everything out of here we possibly can that you might have to touch including bulletins. We are going to be depending on our brand new monitors, and they are very nice, and I hope that uh, you'll enjoy those as much as we can. The one thing that we really are troubled by that we can't do for you is to invite people to sing. And we know that that's going to be a heartbreaker. It's a heartbreaker for us. Our choir is, is definitely feeling the pain on that one. Um, but it just is one of those things that's just going to have to wait for a while until we um, are sure that that isn't something that's going to continue to spread uh, the uh, virus. 
we do have and we'll continue to have people singing uh, for us and you'll be invited to hum along, um, you know, sway if you feel like you can as a Presbyterian, um, you know, however it is that you're feeling that spirit moving to you. Um, and we will for just the short uh, period of time, we're going to stick just to having what's happening here at worship. We'll start bringing in Sunday school and nursery and all of those extra things on Sunday mornings when we know that we've worked um, out the, the challenges of the sanctuary first, and then we'll start bringing up some other um, items as well. But for now, let us, with this uh, joyful expectation about that opportunity to come together, let us reflect and pray. Let us enter into a time of worship where we glorify God. Good morning, church. I am so glad that you have joined us. Last week, I told you about my adventures with Vacation Bible School, and you were supposed to see a video. That kind of didn't happen. We had a few technical difficulties, but this week, I do want to show you the video for our time together because it was such a special time. But I also want to tell you that this past week, we did Vacation Bible School over at our preschool, Small Blessings, and 44 children enjoyed um, learning more about Jesus and how he loves them just as they are, and how they are called to love one another, just as we are called to love one another. Part of our social distancing and wearing masks and doing all of these things as we think about coming back to worship is really an act of love. It's an act of love for each other. And so I want you to take the time right now to watch the video and see Love in Action at Vacation Bible School. And thank you for the things we're thankful for and help us to be thankful.
Good afternoon, good morning to you, uh, uh, and it is my pleasure to, uh, to be here today uh, and to be your final online person before we open the church. So, uh, so let's get started with our scripture, which comes from the book of Luke, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it, and if it bears fruit next year, it's all well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. Amen. Who are we to blame when something bad happens? The whole topic of free will is open to debate. It's the perennial question of nature versus nurture. We may be what we are because of heredity, we are likely to look as we do because our genes 
tall or short, slim or stout, athletic or clumsy, quick-witted or slow, we bear the imprint of our ancestors. Yet we're still not sure that's the cause of our problem, because nurture plays a role in what we become. Isn't that why parents play Mozart to their infants? However, our homes and communities often support the opposite, injustice, social disharmony, racism, sexism, and economic disparities are often blamed on the environment. The problems of the nation are blamed on working mothers, underprivileged communities, poor schools, and we have spent billions upon billions of dollars hoping to eradicate poverty and disadvantaged environments. And that gets us down to our parents. Whether it was their bad genes or just a bad environment, it must be their fault. I read a letter to Dear Abby the other day from a wife whose husband at age 41 started taking clarinet lessons. She wrote because her in-laws were refusing to pay for the lessons that they should, she thought, after all, they were to blame for depriving him of his clarinet lessons as a child. Blame the stars, blame the schools, blame the government, blame the folks, even blame oneself. We do it and we keep on doing it. We ask the same question, whose fault is it anyway? We recognize that there is something amiss, something wrong in our country, our community, schools and workplaces, churches and homes. There is something very wrong with our health, our emotions, our spirituality. It simply comes down to there being something very wrong with us. We are not as we should be. It's what the Bible calls sin. We have fallen short of God's intention. That is why the Bible says, that is what the Bible says, but it begs the question, whose sin? Now God's ways are not our ways. God speaks through the prophet Isaiah and tells us as much when he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So it's not just a matter of God's ways and thoughts and actions being different than ours. It's that God's ways and thoughts and actions are vastly superior to ours. This is great news. It means God's grace and forgiveness are not tied to or encumbered by our understanding of judgment and justice. God's otherness makes all things possible. Even God's name speaks to us of God's otherness. God's name is really unspeakable. It's unpronounceable. Y-H-W-H, four consonants, no vowels. It's often referred to as the tetragram and is most widely translated as I am, or I am who I am. Incidentally, a quick read through the Gospels, you'd discover that many times Jesus referred to himself as I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. It was only later that Bible translators decided to add vowels, thus creating the name Yahweh. All of this is to say that God's ways are not our ways, and this is reflected in God's name. We also know that we need a faithful understanding of God's otherness. If we're to wrap our heads around this morning's gospel lesson, in which Jesus challenges our limited comprehension of God's judgment, sin, grace, and mercy. As strange as it sounds, we often find comfort in a significant theological misnomer that tells us all suffering is the result of God's judgment on our sin. Now, to one degree or another, we've all found ourselves thinking in terms of simple reward and punishment. 
For example, God rewards us when we're good and punishes us when we're bad. We like the whole reward and punishment scenario because it eliminates randomness, it explains suffering, it makes judgment mechanical, and it offers us a way to avoid disaster. If we just be good boys and girls, nothing bad will ever happen. Good luck with that. But that is how we humans do it. That's the way of imagining how things work. But remember, God is not mortal, and God's ways are not our ways. God is other. So if not our way, then what is Yahweh's? How do we make sense of disaster? Why do bad things happen to good people? Does God punish us for our sin? These are age-old questions that theologians and philosophers have struggled with over the ages. Yet we seem to keep running to the same simple answer, sin. We've all been there. Something really rotten happens to us, and we wonder what we've done to, to warrant such punishment. It works on others, too. We observe someone who we're not particularly fond of, and they're going through a difficult time, and we think quietly to ourselves, ah, they're suffering from God's judgment. Jesus tackles this issue boldly by addressing two situations. The first is the massacre of some Galileans by Pilate who drained their blood in the temple. These poor people came to the temple to offer their sacrifices to God, and Pilate's officers slaughtered them in that holy place and profaned the altar with their blood. The people who bring this news to Jesus are hoping he can make sense out of this nonsensical event. Jesus knows what they want and knows what they're thinking. They're thinking these slaughtered Gal Galileans died that way because of some unforgivable sin they must have committed. Jesus' response is straightforward and to the point, not at all what the people are expecting to hear. Jesus says, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. Jesus then offers a second disastrous scenario of those 18 or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them do you think that they were worse offenders than all the men who dwell in Jerusalem? Again, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. Stand by. Coffee energizer. So what do we get out of all this? Well, the good news is that Jesus' response to a simple reward and punishment is, no, it doesn't work that way. God's ways are not our ways. Nevertheless, Jesus does call for repentance, lest we end up dying like the massacred Galileans and the 18 who had the tower fall on them. Now, I have to admit, that's more than a little confusing. On the one hand, Jesus is saying, we cannot connect disaster to God's judgment. Things happen. That's just the way it is. But on the other hand, Jesus seems to be saying, we all need to repent or God's judgment is going to fall on us like a tower, like the Tower of Siloam. Am I the only one who thinks that's a bit contradictory? Viktor Frankl spent a long time in, in a concentration camp. So he suggests something similar to repentance when he describes what it was that made life tolerable for some, while others simply gave up and died. What was really needed was a fundamental change in our attitude toward life. We had to learn that it did not really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. We needed to stop asking the meaning of life and instead, think of ourselves as those who are being questioned by life, 
daily and hourly. What this says to me is that we live in a fallen and broken world. Whether by the hand of a tyrant or the force of nature, terrible things happen, and when they do, innocent people suffer and die. In our own day, we know all too well the horrors of the Holocaust and genocide and ethnic cleansing, tornadoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and now COVID-19. Is it too much to say we can expect no less? Whether you die a natural death or by the hand of a terrorist or by a bolt of lightning, the end result is the same. You die. One way or the other, we're all born to die. The question is whether or not you'll choose to live. And what Jesus makes clear is that the only way to live, to really live, is to repent, to turn to God and seek God's will for our lives, to lose our lives in devotion to Christ, and in so doing, discover life in all of its abundance. Unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. It's a warning and a promise. If you repent, you'll experience life in all of its abundance. If you don't repent, you'll die, which is not necessarily to say that you'll stop breathing, but you'll never experience the fullness of life God has in store for you. You'll always fall short. You'll never be satisfied and content with what you have. Plus, you'll be consumed by bitterness, anger, worry and anxiety, pettiness and strife. Unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. To repent is to change, but we resist that like the plague. Not surprisingly, when it comes to change, we do our best to circumvent it any way we can. I think in an effort to avoid change, we take an active approach and manipulate situations to our advantage. We do every good work imaginable. We go to church, we read the Bible, we serve on committees, we participate in community events, we even pray and read devotional literature. We do all these things, but at the end of the day, we're just as set as our ways as ever. It's as if we're immune to change. It's a paradox. The more we invite change, the more we stay the same. Maybe what comes next will be of some help. Jesus offers a parable about a fig tree that hasn't produced any fruit. The owner of the vineyard wants to cut it down. The gardener wants to cultivate it. The parable, like so many of Jesus' parables, is left open-ended. We are left to draw our own conclusions, but this parable comes in the context of Jesus speaking against a simple theological theology of divine reward and punishment. With that in mind, perhaps part of what the parable is suggesting to us is that Jesus is at work in our lives to lead us not only to repentance, but also to a time and place where we bear good fruit. I think that's the good news of the parable. The bad news is that there is a limit to God's patience, and if the tree doesn't bear good fruit in a year, it will be cut down. I don't think Jesus chose the fig tree out of the blue. He just pulled it out as an example. There's meaning here. Fig trees take a long time to grow and mature. It can take four to five years for a fig tree to begin producing good fruit. So to grow fig trees takes commitment, patience and perseverance, and active cultivation. The suggestion is that this is analogous, analogous to God's commitment to growing us. In Jesus, we have a gardener who advocates for us, who seeks to nurture our growth and development, that we might produce good fruit. Still, Jesus wants, to see, wants us to see that there is a limit to the vineyard owner's patience, a limit to God's patience. We can safely assume the tree has the necessary time to produce fruit, four or five years, and yet nothing. 
We can also safely assume that the vineyard owner knows all about fig trees. The reference to three years is most likely three years of growth on top of the four to five years and actually usually takes a fig tree to bear fruit. In other words, this fig tree has had more than enough time to grow fruit. The gardener asks the vineyard owner for what one more year, and it will be a year in which the gardener will give this one fig tree special attention. Put it all together, and we come to see that God's ways are not our ways. God does not enact judgment by having towers fall on people as punishment for their sin. Yet Jesus also says that if we don't repent, we too will die a death like those who died at the hands of Pilate's soldiers or those who had a tower fall on them. In light of the parable of the fig tree, I think what Jesus is saying here is that repentance leads to new life, a life of bearing good fruit. A lack of repentance leads to a lack of life, a lack of good fruit, an existence that is like death. I think Jesus is also saying that God is patience, patient with us, that God has patience beyond human imagination, but there is ultimately a limit to God's patience. Still, in the person of the gardener, we have the Christ who comes into our non-fruit-bearing, non-repentant lives and works with us, works around us, works in us to grow us into the people God wants us to be. That's the heart of the good news. In Christ, we see that God intervenes in our histories for good, not for harm. Christ comes to save and rescue, not to kill or cause towers to fall on us. In Christ, we see that God has chosen us that we might come to choose Yahweh over our ways. And we make this choice through repentance, through a conscious decision to cease those behaviors that lead to isolation, separation, and death, and seek new ways of living that are God-directed and God-inspired. What we need to be about is truth that leads to change, and not simply truth for truth's sake. Think about it. The reason we sing God's praise on Sundays is so we can sing God's praise throughout the week. The reason we study God's word is so that we might become a living word to others. The reason we reach out to others in the name of Jesus is so that they too might come to know him as Lord and Savior. Unless we're about truth that leads to change, we're just going in circles. We're like the fig tree in the little parable Jesus told his followers. Unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. God calls us to turn from the ways of the world and walk in the footsteps of Jesus. God calls us to embrace in our own lives and proclaim to others a truth that leads to change. Luke says that John the Baptist went so far as to specify changes various people needed to make. When the people asked him, what shall we do to escape the wrath of God? He said, he who has two coats, let him give to them who has none. To those who have food, let him do likewise. Tax collectors, collect no more than what is appointed to you. Soldiers, extort from no one by violence, neither accuse anyone wrongfully. Be content with your wages. To repent is to see God's active love reaching out to tend and nurture our fig tree lives. To repent is to choose life over death. To repent is to trust our lives to the gardener. To repent is to live lives that bear good fruit, the fruits of repentance, the fruits of faithfulness that bring the holy assurance that whatever happens in life or in death, our God will never forsake us. One of the benefits of this COVID-19 virus, I thought you'd never hear that in a sentence, 
is that it gives us time to think about changes we need to make in our own lives. While we're sitting in our houses, isolated from everyone else, we get to think. So we get to think about the changes we make in our own lives, how to get back on track to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. So what do we hear the Spirit saying to us today? What changes do we need to make in order to stand blameless before the throne of God's grace? Let us surrender ourselves and let the gardener do his work. Amen. Jim, thank you for those words. Um, let us spend a time of some silent meditation reflecting on uh, the words that God has given Jim to us this morning, and then we'll continue with the prayers of the people. Abba, Father, uh, you have seen us stuck in traffic. We've sat on I-4 where we can see the nearest exit, but we can't go forward. We certainly can't go backwards, so we're forced to inch our way home. Heavenly Father, we have felt this with the COVID-19 pandemic. We were cruising along and making great time, and suddenly we came to a complete stop and were powerless to move any further. We condition ourselves to be patient that is, until we run out of patience. We need to acknowledge that we are not in control and unable to make life move at our preferred pace. That this can be an invitation to release our frustration at our powerlessness and turn the steering wheel of our lives over to you, who is actually the one who is in control and knows where we're headed. Proverbs 3 gives us sound wisdom and advice for navigating life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. The word trust means to have confidence and put our security in something or someone. So we need to promise to trust in you entirely, trust in you exclusively, trust in you exactly, trust in you expectantly. Yahweh, when we feel stuck in life's traffic and we're powerless to move forward, we indeed have the choice to trust you with all our heart, knowing we don't have to have all the answers, but to yield to your loving presence and power and allow you to lead us in your perfect timing to your perfect destination for our lives. Take our hands off the steering wheel for you are with us. Through constantly acknowledging you and leaning on your wisdom, timing, and direction, you will lead us to peace, real freedom, love, and eternal life. So let us pray together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Before we exit, I'd like to say Happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Uh, may it be a wonderful experience for you, uh, and uh, you get to spend some extra time at home, hopefully. So, uh, please join me in the benediction. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now this day and every day. Amen.